took going out for this. My gosh. Every time I see this, it hits me. Yeah, well, same. I mean, I mentioned um, in my intro that I, I watch this documentary at least once a year, and I have to say, I, I cry at all of the same parts. Um, and I think, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, I definitely want to talk a bit about some of the decisions behind um, the shape of the narrative and, 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 and um, why you did certain things. Uh, but first, I think maybe we could just start off at the beginning. Um, how did you come to get involved with this project and how familiar were you um, before working on this with ACT UP and, and, and folks like Peter Staley and Bob Rasky and also David France, who, um, if I'm not mistaken, had a journalistic career and also had written a, a book that then developed into this documentary. So, um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, to, 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 he, he actually started with the idea of writing a book and made the film. And then the book happened probably about five years ago. I think he finally finished it. Um, it's, it's sort of a roundabout story, but I met him probably about 15 years ago now, just doing some DVD burning that he needed done. It was at the start of my career of editing. And he was finding these VHS tapes. He was part of ACT UP. He's actually in a couple of the shots. Really? Very, very in, in the back. You know, he's, he has cameos in every one of his films. But he needed some DVDs burnt of footage that he'd been finding. And um, I'd go over to his place and we'd just talk about the project that he's considering making. Because he's just going to people's apartments that he knew that had maybe even recently passed or a widow or a, or a partner of theirs said, hey, I have a whole bunch of tapes. What can I do with these? And then he just started collecting them. And he said, maybe there's a movie in here. So I was helping him throughout the years. And they needed a promo cut to get some uh, money from, I think, Sundance. And I said, hey, I can do this. And I cut a promo for him, and it got them the first round of the funding. And then from there on, uh, they hired Woody to, to edit, along with myself, to just sort of take the whole 800 hours that we acquired and whittle it down to this. I think our first cut, this is always something that grows and grows. I think our first cut was 11 or 12 hours. And I mean, from, from calling it down from like 800 hours, that's pretty. That's pretty good, but we yeah. had to watch it over two days and then, you know, sort of rinse and repeat, cut cut it in half and cut it in half and cut it in half. Took the whole process, took about a year and a half of editing with two editors, so that's almost three years total is what we kind of calculated to be. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's always it's always amazing to me to think that, you know, a lot of these tapes that, that he found, that we digitized, that we brought in and worked with, hadn't seen a screen since they had been pulled out of the camera. They were just shot. You know, uh, video cameras were, were becoming ubiquitous at the time, and people would just go to these events, go to the protests, just film everything, and just shove it under their bed. And there it just sat for years and years and years. And David remembered these tapes. He remembered people shooting these things, and it just slowly started acquiring it. I think it's, it's one of those testaments to just filmmaking in general, that someone has an idea they figure out a way to make it and just collecting collecting archival footage in the way that he did was just, I don't know, unprecedented. And he's created the largest archive um, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with another filmmaker named Jim Hubbard who we use a lot of his footage as well um, uh, of ACT UP and that whole era, so. And one of the really interesting narrative choices um, that uh, you and Woody and David make is that this choice to, for some of the major players like Peter Staley and Mark Harrington, um, just kind of limit their screen time to the archival footage. And then you have, I guess, what could be called like a big reveal moment where towards the end of the film, we see them in the present day. And uh, I mean, I, when I watched this for the first time, I let out a breath that I didn't know I was holding. Um, because if you're, if you're not, I guess, very familiar with uh, what these people are currently up to, then this question of like, did they survive? Are they still around? It's kind of looming over uh, the proceedings. So then, you know, that that moment when we see them uh, is is very powerful. Uh, so I was curious, um, at what what point did you decide when you were edit editing this that that's how you wanted um, to approach that? Um, was that did it kind of just develop that way when you were assembling the film, or was there always this idea of like, we're, we are going to kind of keep it to the archival footage and then bring them in later? 
That's a, that's a good question. And I think that your reaction is exactly why we kept it in, that breath that is let out. We did several test screenings to find that moment of relief that we were looking for. Because there's one thing to just say, oh, well, drugs happened and everyone's fine. You know, but then there's just the emotional connection to the characters that we've been watching that we tested it over and over and tried to find that sweet spot. But I will say that that original idea, David and I figured out in the promo, the, this promo that we cut for Sundance, it was about 10 minutes long. We hid Peter Staley and then revealed him at the end of that. And that just persisted throughout every cut that we had. And then we tweaked it to add other, other uh, people in it. Uh, but ultimately, I mean, it just, it just, it always played well, and we didn't want people to know that, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a story where we're going to start in the present day and then look back on, and then come back to it. It just wasn't that kind of a story because we needed to have this what we call the bomb under the bed throughout throughout the entire film. We start with people sick and dying. First image is someone dying and and sick, um, and just to have that throughout the entire film and Bob Rafsky. Peter Staley say it constantly, I'm going to die from this, I'm going to die from this. So you don't expect them to, to survive. But then just that feeling that you get whenever you see Peter survive, it contrasts the feeling that you felt when Bob Rafsky passed, which is, that moment always just gets me. Same, you know, yeah. it's, it's to, to add just a, a little quick story about that, we, we had a very difficult time finding a way to um, say that Bob Rafsky passed. We had an ACT UP meeting where there's hundreds of people there after his funeral, after his death, and everyone is going around talking about their favorite story about Bob, how bold he was, and you know all of that stuff is wonderful and on screen. We just couldn't find the emotion from anybody in the, in the crowd. And then one day, I think it might have been Woody, he found that funeral footage where Sarah and her mom are just there, and it's just, there's no speaking or anything. It's just the sound of her releasing the emotion that she had and the mom and her mom just just grabbing her and just taking the minute there to, to just comfort her daughter is that just said it all and every time that gets me every time that gets me and Sarah's, Sarah's a wonderful human being um, you should follow her on everything she's a she's a journalist in her own right and she's done some pretty incredible films too so and I, I believe she also um, is, is involved in this network of, of people who's parents died of AIDS related illness. So she uh, definitely still seems to be working to keep the memory of her father alive and certainly in um, her journalistic work because I, uh, I believe she covers a lot of social justice related yeah. issues. So yeah. um, she's yeah. pretty amazing following in her father's footsteps. For sure. Yeah. Um, I guess to, to start, it, it kind of is when you can show that age and nominate. I actually lived through some most of this. I was in college in the 80s and I had friends who died in New York. AIDS. Um, in New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess it was amazing for me the first time I watched it when it first came out, seeing the real footage of the ashes being thrown at Washington or the um, sit in and the activities at uh, the cathedral in New York. Um, for yourself, you said, you know, there was all of this footage that just came across um, and there was so much you probably could have kept in what you said. When you started to bring it together, and then the editing starts, was there anything that you would have liked in there that you couldn't make, or did it really just flow the way you uh, you see it on the screen, the screen to start? Gosh, that is such a great question, because it is so interesting to watch this film with people who went through it, because they respond in a way that I, I, I didn't know about this. To, sorry, to, to answer your question from before, I didn't know anything about this. You know, I grew up knowing AIDS was bad, wear a condom. That's what was told to me in school. And then to start going through this footage at the age that I was, I think I was 30 when I started working on this film, looking back on this stuff that had happened about 15 to 20 years prior, it said to me, wow, this was going on during your childhood and growing up in a religious childhood, this was absolutely shielded from you. Um, the word gay was not allowed in my household. My parents have come a long way. They are wonderful these days, I gotta tell you. But, but still, um, that's something that just never really was part of my world and finding myself in the edit room with Woody as well we didn't go through this this wasn't our life and to watch it with people when the film was finally released and done was heartbreaking because everyone had their own story and we could not tell everyone everybody's story in this film 
And there's criticism in that, and that's fine, and that's totally understandable that we can't tell everybody's story in this. You know, it's it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing to to have to accept, um, but it just gives more opportunity, I think, for other people to tell their stories as well. And I hope more people do tell their stories through this, yeah. through oh. through through just finding, you know, finding themselves in footage and and making their own stories. You know, Peter Staley wrote a book mm -hmm. recently. Uh, it was um, just in Allentown recently, actually, at oh, the it? LGBT community center in Allentown, promoting his book. Yeah. That's great. His book is his book is awesome. His, and Ron Goldberg wrote a book just came out, Boy with a Bullhorn. He's one of the he's the chant queen in there. He's wonderful. So. But but it's still wonderful. I mean, based on what you were able to show, it it, it is transferable to other stories. And you watching it just now, a couple things stood out. Um, is when you see all of the people in this, uh, whether it's just the activists or Peter Stanley and others who are going through their own personal hell with, with having AIDS, is how you capture it in their eyes and the darkness of their eyes. And that is something I, I, I remember seeing. And also, there's one statement, I think on the screen, it's from 1987, where uh, one of them was saying, you know, my friends are dying every day. and and that really was what it was like for those decades. Mm -hmm. And then you see the joy in it in the end when they finally discover his cocktail. Mm -hmm. So it, it does bring a wonderful evolution to the story that is relatable across whoever you could bring into the film. Mm -hmm. um, but again, just from being an editor, how do you kind of splice it all together with the music and the sound that goes with it plus you know, like Adriana was saying, you're going back in between lectures and then raw footage, uh, bringing that all together. It's, I mean, it's, it's a long process. I know we have a couple editors in the, in the crowd here, they know as well. It's just, it, it takes a lot of trial and error to just be able to get the information out. That's step one, what's the backbone of the film? And then that's always way too much. And then you need to realize what, what you actually, what story you actually have to tell. But one thing that we that we um, discovered along the way was we didn't know Peter Staley was going to be the heart of the film. We didn't know that. We didn't know Mark Harrington. We didn't know all this stuff. But what we did remember we started watching the footage, which took us about six months to just watch the footage. Six months while we're making you know markers and selects the entire time, trying to figure out a narrative or figure out which characters started to pop up. That's when we noticed, hey, this Peter guy is in, in it a lot. Hey, this Mark Harrington guy is in it a lot. Garant's Frank Root is in it a lot. She's Awesome. She's a, she's a great person. We started to see these wonderful people uh, popping up, and then we went and got interviews. Um, those those black background ones that sort of put us out of space and time, um, and then we just sort of cut the film together as chronologically as possible, and that included lots of interviews. That included tons of archival that sometimes repeated itself, just so we could see what we had, and then we just after that eleven, sometimes twelve, maybe it's up to thirteen hour cut now. Um, you know, we, we just went through that and just hacked that in half and just tried to tried to figure out, you know, is this story important, is this story or not? Actually, I was reading a, a, an article today about the Lockerbie bombing. There was there's someone um, who was just um, arrested for that, which I believe happened in 1988. And an interesting side note is that there was a doctor on the Lockerbie bombing who had some protease inhibitor documents with him. He was taking it somewhere. And he passed on that on that bombing, and we could have potentially had it much earlier, and that was a story we told in the film, but it didn't find a place for the for the final film. But that's part of the history. You know, we have famous people who are passing that are, you know, I think we mentioned like Freddie Mercury in here. He was a bigger part of the film at one point. We also had um, Alden McCain was a huge part. He was a busker in New York. He um, he was almost a Bob Rasky type character, international traveler. Um, just a, a very strong activist, and he brought a lot of life to the film. He brought a lot of song and dance and a lot of energy to the film. And we were working with our consultant. We were doing test screenings, and the film was just it was over two hours, and it just wasn't it just wasn't landing. Someone suggested, I think our story consultant Jonathan Oppenheim, Jonathan Oppenheim, said take out all of Alden's scenes, and we did, and the whole film just locked right in place. And it's really sad when that happens because it's a character you love and you've worked on so much and you really want them to work and they do work, but just the film doesn't have an emotional impact because people start to you know, get restless or people start to fade 
uh, it's too much information for them to, to track. So, you know, in, a, in, in this very compressed um, uh, storytelling format, sometimes stories get lost and, you know, it's, it's tragic and sad, but, you know, we, in, in order to get the bigger picture out, in order to try to make more impact, you need to make a tight, good, entertaining film so people will talk about it and, and, and see it. Do you think the, the part where you have the quilt, uh, because you do hear Peter Allen's name, you see the quilt of Rock Hudson, you do hear Mercury, yeah. Freddie Mercury, at least that captures the mm -hmm. immense it's in the scope, yeah. 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 Um, I think right now uh, we're going to turn things over to the audience. Uh, if you have a question for Tyler, please, I mean Kyle, you're going to have a question. Uh, just please raise your hand. Um, Kyle, we'll start with you. Um, so this started as a festival film, obviously, doing the festival circuit. I actually was at, in a screening at the library in Park City. Oh, wow. um, that was my first time at Sundance, and I vividly remember uh, walking out of that screening. Um, the, the, it's long for a festival documentary. And obviously, you had options to make it much longer. What kind of what kind of pressure were you under as far as considering the market? And quite frankly, it's an incredibly sad film that manages its tone very well. How concerned were you about being able to take the time to tell that story compared to what an audience was sitting through? Mm. We we didn't have pressure if that's if that's the question to 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 come in at a certain length. But we wanted to make it watchable. Yeah. We didn't want to make it a two-parter. We didn't want to make it a series. And the series weren't really like as huge as they are back then. Um, you know, I'm talking like ten years ago at Sundance. But um, yeah, we didn't really have a lot of pressure to make it what it is. We just wanted to make a really good film, and it was David's first film, so they really praised first-time filmmakers. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think you know Sundance. Sundance invited us with a phone call, and I have it on video actually. I recorded it with my with my phone, and we were just flabbergasted because we'd been in the edit room for over a year, and our brains were like, what is going on in the world? We have no idea, we're working six, seven days a week, um, not really having relationships outside of it, and that just felt validating, yeah. that, hey, something's working in this, there's some there's some magic in this, we're, we're starting to tell some part of LGBTQ plus history that has never been told, and now is the time to tell it, and wow, it's lining up to just launch it. So, you know, I don't, I don't think we were going to make this film be a, be a feel-good film from the beginning. That's not, that's not what we wanted. That's kind of impossible, I would think, to, for, for the subject matter. Um, hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't, it wasn't a commission piece, so there wasn't any feedback from like a network or a streamer yeah. or anything, which is pretty common these days to get that kind of feedback. Any other questions for Tyler? Yes. Thank you, Tyler. This was so great. I always love watching this movie, and it's really been interesting to hear you talk about your own work, trying to think about all this footage you have, paring it down into a narrative, not only telling a story about these characters that have to be fully fledged out, but also thinking about the tremendous task of creating emotions. And so we talked about we talked about sadness. We kind of talk about this love that these activists are feeling for each other. But there's also so much anger inside of this movie, and I was curious about how you, as an editor, tried to facilitate anger through pastiches of footage. And then also, like, what was the process like of working with the focus groups, coming back? Basically, how were you kind of moving across all of these emotional spectra as you were working? Gosh, it, yeah, well, it's, it's difficult to, to know whether or not a film is going to affect you or not while you're editing it. Um, sometimes it really doesn't, and sometimes it, it's unavoidable. And this is, this is what I think that I learned that on. This was my second feature. I hadn't done, I'd done, I'd done a smaller one about computer hacking before this, and that wasn't like an emotional journey. It was very kind of informative and very energetic and a little bit heisty in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and then here I'm presented with people who are dying in front of me and their families and how it affects their friends and everyone around them. And uh, my edit room was very, this is so funny to, to think about these days. We were editing out of Joy Thompson. She's one of the, the executive producer's uh, offices and she's in real estate in New York. So her office is not an editing place or a filmmaking place at all. So we had these just corner desks for, for interns, but there was one uh, room that was called a fish tank because it was just windows on either side. That was Woody's room and our assistant, it was big enough for them. And I had a, an offshoot that was basically a closet 
that we just, it, it, was, it was very shoestring. It was very shoestring to, to make this film. And, and I was in there, and the first time that I watched, there's, a, there's some footage of Bob Rafsky holding Sarah on his hip, and they're just dancing. And I saw that for the first time, and I said, wow, you know, there's a song that I heard called For a Friend by the Communards. And that, that's a song that I just sort of came across while, while listening to some, you know, 80s music. And I just threw that underneath, and, and, I, and I, you know, uh, put the footage on top, hit play, and just started bawling my eyes out. And I did not expect that to happen. David heard me and, like, walked in and was like, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not okay. And uh, he came in and I showed him, and we both just started crying. And that's where David and I, I think, really connected. Um, and yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm off on a tangent here. But uh, yeah, it's hard to know, <laughs> you know, how a film is going to affect you. Um, and then, okay, to get to get back on track with the, with sort of the test screenings, um, whenever you work on a film so much, it, you kind of become desensitized to it. And you get that back, you get your, your sort of raw emotion back and how it actually feels by watching it with people. And so our first test screening, um, I think the film was at that point two and a half hours. We had uh, John Cameron Mitchell was in, was in our audience. It was, it was only like six people and John Cameron Mitchell was there. And he, as soon as the film was done, he was part of ACT UP, as soon as the film was done, he just said, wow, thank you. That was his. That was the initial feedback, and that set the tone for the feedback that we were about to get. That lasted, you know, probably a couple hours, getting that feedback. And as soon as we were done with that, I went out into the, you know, lobby and just started crying again. Where did this come from? I hadn't cried in, you know, months. You know, we've been putting the film together, and from then on, we just really trusted um, test audiences to tell us whether or not something's working. And we would all sit in the back. You know, our, our test audience got bigger and bigger. Usually we start with like filmmakers, editors, people who can tell us just what the heck out. And then we get bigger and bigger into people who are uh, just general people. You know, we pull, pull them off the street. Hey, do you want to come sit and watch a movie? We'll give you popcorn um, and give us feedback. Please. So we'll, we'll sit in the back of the audience and just watch everybody and watch when there's a shuffle in the seat or watch, you know, we, we take everyone's phone so they're not, or didn't take everyone's phone, but we would tell them, to turn their phones off, but you can tell when people are just, they start to get a little bit restless, and you know, ah, you know, it's probably not that moment right there, but it's a scene prior, usually, um, that sort of just says, okay, this is too much information, we need to give them a, a second to absorb that information, let's show some beauty shots or something, so they can just take a second, let that settle, then they're more open to something. So there was a lot of that kind of surgery throughout the film, and I really encourage that for other filmmakers as well to just do a lot of test screenings, they're very valuable. Um, hopefully that answers your question. There. One yeah. quick follow up: um, Were you? How frequent was it for people to walk out emotionally during that? Because I know I've worked on things where that was a key data point for us. Was like, at what point does someone become so overwhelmed that they need to leave? Um, was that something that you wow. encountered? I I would love to encounter that, but I've never encountered that before. I think I've encountered that on a different film. But for different reasons, yeah. Not not for something. It's just that, like how do you manipulate the yeah when, yeah when you have the data point, it's something that's nice to be able to go. Oh, maybe we need to back off a little bit. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Let's back away from that. Wow. Well, that sounds like a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. I mean, gosh, to to be able to affect someone where they're walking out. Wow. Yeah. I, I can't imagine that. That'd be that'd be so cool. Um. Well, they, we did a phone call. Welcome to Chechnya, David. David France and I. We had a lot of people. For at the end of that, just depressed, you know? And we had to have some sort of positivity afterwards. Um, so we've had that kind of situation where it's like, you can't just, you know, just make everyone leave thinking the world is awful. Um, you have to give a little bit of hope. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't watch a lot of documentaries. <laughs> I, you know, working in social issues documentaries for the past 10 years or so, maybe more, it's just, it becomes too much to just then go watch something that is also a documentary. And, and a lot of documentaries are social issues, stuff that I, that, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all have our own 
um, palettes that we like. And I just, I can't get into like murder porn stuff. I can't get into reality show and money and financial, you know, stuff like that. I, I can't really do that. So if there's anything that I do like watching, it's things like, documentary wise, it's probably things like chicken people, you know, about like competitive chicken breeding and silly things that just take my mind off of something. But really I'm into escapist fantasy type type films um, in general. So I don't really have any recommendations for you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, just to keep, uh, this might be a little technical, but you mentioned that you were a pretty low budget operation at the beginning. Um, I'm thinking probably, what, what, what would this be, 2008, 2009? This, we started cutting in 2010, uh, I believe. Okay, so like, yeah. How, with the sheer volume of video footage you have, obviously a lot of it is SD, but what was your editorial process as far as how do you get your rough cut together? Did you have a paper edit? Were you, was all your footage even accessible on shared storage? Like, how much of a nightmare was just keeping track of the sheer amount of footage, and how did you pare that down into your actual structure? I mean, it, it was a nightmare, right? It, we didn't have any shared storage back then. It was just okay. all on, like, G-type drives. Please tell me you had, G, uh, had script sync, at least. No, we didn't have script sync. Oh <laughs> No, that came out during it. I think we got it maybe like towards the end and by then we had already had our systems in, in place. Um, but no, it was a lot of just, you know, our assistant had a set of about 30 drives. Woody had a set of, of about 20 drives. I had another 20. And then if, if we wanted to share sequences and kind of put things together, trusty old thumb drive, got the project on it. I'm not even kidding, like this was, this was pretty back in the day. <laughs> Back in the day, it's still pretty cool though. <laughs> uh, any more audience questions for Tyler? Thank you all for coming out, yeah, for experiencing thanks. this. Again, thanks for holding this. Really appreciate you guys having this event. This is this is wonderful. Well, we honest. appreciate you being here. Um, and then I just have one last question. Um, I'm just curious about what projects you, you currently have going on. I know that you're working on your own feature uh, that I. I read that it was about a small world phenomenon, but I'm not actually sure what that is. The, the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. There's, there, I've been working on this with a group of about four friends for the past 10 years, following the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. The origin story of that, which actually has an origin with this mathematician named Paul Erdős. So we went to like Hungary and filmed there for, for a bit. Um, but that's, that's one that's sort of a, a, a love project for all us four. I'm, I'm currently writing a script with a script partner, kind of about editing, actually. Um, and, and then also, a, um, I'm editing a film about cloning right now. I'm sort of taking a step back from social issues. And I'm I found this really great crew of people in, in LA that's making a, an awesome film about pet cloning. But it's more than just that. I'll just, I'll just say that. It's going to be really, it's going to be funny. It's going to be funny. So, and then I have a, a film coming out on HBO in, um, I think, I think spring, end of spring, called Great Photo, Lovely Life. It's about family trauma and uh, the way uh, a family dealt with um, some very intense stuff in their lives. Um, but also, I just want to mention, I mentioned this to Kyle, there's a sequel to How to Survive a Plague on uh, HBO Max called How to Survive a Pandemic. It came out last year, and it's about um, surviving COVID and what was done to make that happen. Um, and, you know, I, I was sort of teasing uh, someone in the audience here about who wants to watch a pandemic film. I get it. I get it. But if you ever find yourself wanting to watch something, just sort of reliving a little bit of what happened behind everything, um, and it does have hints of some of the activists here in the film, check it out. It's on sure HBO. Both probably feature Fauci. <laughs> there, is a, there is a Fauci moment in there, that's for sure. That's for sure. Well, thanks again, Tyler. Uh, yeah, this was definitely. great. Definitely. Thanks so much for coming on.